am the owner of the Sokol Group Real Estate Company here in beautiful 10 degrees Chicago. Uh, we do residential, commercial, and uh, I'm a licensed business broker. So franchises, bars, restaurants, and all that stuff too. And uh, this is my first uh, shindig with you guys. So very excited to learn and meet some folks and definitely prefer to do it over a drink and food in person soon. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome, Andy. Welcome to the club and happy to have you here. Uh, John, you spelled your name all funky, but John, it's your turn. And you are, there you are, you're off mute now. Okay. I'm John Oliveri. I'm an architect and real estate developer in the Southwest suburbs. I've been a member of the club for about five or six years. I I go to once in a while, I go to some real estate meetings and I've been to entrepreneur meetings and just hanging out at the club. Yep. John has been an active member for a long time. So thank you, John. And I think he's underselling his involvement with how much interest he has in the real estate world. So thanks for being here, John. Thanks. Um, Mark Blakemore, you want to take yourself off mute and introduce yourself? There we Good go. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Mark Blakemore. I um, have been a member of the Union League Club for a few years. I've been a part of the real estate group uh, for a few years, okay? Um, and um, I'm a uh, owner and manager of a large um, portfolio of residential rental properties in the south suburbs of Chicago. <clears throat> Keeping yourself busy. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for your input. Greg C. You want to take yourself off mute and member of the club. What brings you here today? Um, I'm Greg Cook. I'm an architect with Halliburton Root Architects. I've been with the club about eight years and I've been with the real estate committee pretty much that whole time. Okay. I'm interested in commercial real estate, which we do and uh, we do a lot of build the suits. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for being here today. Uh, Susan, I know you signed on with with your video on, so you can leave it on or leave it off. There you are. Come on back, girl. Who are you? What brings you here today? Hi, I'm uh, Sue Golden, and thank you. I was just jumping off another call. Um, member since, I'm trying to think, March of such a blurry year, 2019. Um, just interested. Live in Chicago. Um, we've got a condo in the city, house in the suburbs, a couple rental properties that um, we own, so really just more interested. And I may put you, I may close my camera only because um, we're going to make dinner. <laughs> <laughs> close away and send over anything that has brownies in it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Susan. Um, Dwayne Clark, we are going around the room introducing ourselves. And if you're a member of the club and what brings you here today? Uh, Dwayne Clark, member of the club. i um, been with real estate from the beginning. I am an environmental consultant and I'm at the club anywhere from two to three days a week. I encourage everybody to come down, have lunch, dinner, coffee shops back open, rendezvous back open. Uh, I think events not yet, but uh, come on down and uh, enjoy the club that you're a member of and looking forward to seeing everybody. Yay. Here, here to Dwayne. And he's right. We just, if you guys didn't see the email that came out today, they're they are unrolled a few things at the club to kind of make it more accessible, make some of the eating environments, you know, that we can actually eat there again. So it's still a great place to see some of the faces beyond the Brady Bunch theme here. Um, okay, Mike and May Hill, you guys are next. Feel free to turn your video on, but at least take your audio on. All right, thanks. Um, we joined the club, um, let's see, probably February of 2020. So right, right during COVID. And then COVID hit, so a lot of this has been virtual um, for us, but really enjoying uh, the topics. Um, really interested in this topic because we moved to Chicago about a year and three months ago from New Orleans. So um, thanks so much for putting this on. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Thanks for being here. Uh, Lena Quist, Quist, you are next to my list. Yes, hi, I'm here. I'm also going to be on mute today because I have two kids running around. <laughs> I am, so yeah, so I am an agent at Kelly Williams One Chicago, and I'm not a member. And Ryan 
Wells in inviting me today. So I'm here to listen and learn and I'm excited to hear. Okay, perfect. Thanks for having, thanks for being here. Happy to have you. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Tina M, you've got this lovely work environment, work from home environment on your uh, screen here. It's your turn next. Um, hi, I'm Christina, and I was invited by Marnie. Yeah. Uh, so we know each other through Lyric Young Professionals. Mm -hmm. I'm not a member of the club, but I was just interested in the topic. Thank you for the invitation. And mm -hmm. I will be I will be on mute, and uh, unfortunately today. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Just happy to have you. Thanks, thanks for coming, Christina. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Uh, can I have Miss Natalie, Natalie, you little rock star, it's your turn to introduce yourself and tell us more about what brings you here today and what your interests are. You're currently on mute. There you go. Hey, everyone. Hi, Marnie. My name is Natalie Schmulik. I'm, I run a nonprofit here in Chicago, and I'm not a member. I'm a guest of Marnie, so thank you for having me, and I'm here because I know as little about real estate as I know about crypto, but somehow I got suckered into both. So now I'm here to learn more. Yeah. Well, and Natalie, uh, she's kind of underselling herself as well. She was featured last year as with the top 10 people that you should know in Chicago business-wise alongside some pretty uh, big names, as well as the name of her, um, she works in the food industry and helping food products like make it to the next place. So if you've seen uh, any of our folks on Shark Tank, um, you know, they most likely had some kind of starting at, at Natalie's incubator. So they're doing good work here in Chicago. Uh, next up, RD, I know you're on the phone, but it's your turn to give us uh, your lowdown on what brings you here and what's going on. Hi, I'm RD Yant. I'm a business transaction lawyer at Kaplan, Saunders, Valente, and Beninati. I'm a former chair of the real estate group and a former board member. Great. Thanks for being here, RD. Uh, next up is Janet Johnson. You are rounding us up besides our speakers and co-chair. Okay. I am Janet Johnson. I'm a partner at Schiff Harden. I'm going to be on um, no camera and mute most of the time because my husband's coming in and out. He's just <laughs> painting in our house. So our house is kind of a shambles, but um, I am a commercial real estate lawyer and I've been a member of the club for like 25 years and a member of the real estate group for a long time and was interested in the topic. So that's why I joined in. Great, thank you. Thank you for being here. And Aline, looks Hello. like- Hello. Yeah, your turn, jump on in. I got, um, I was listening to a Elmhurst School District presentation on COVID. So I had multiple computers running here. Um, I'm Eileen Cafasso. I am a leadership development expert and executive coach. I've been a club member for about three years now. Um, I came because I'm interested in the topic since I do have a real estate investment and I'm, my goal is to have a place in the city sometime soon. And because I wanted to see Emily. Hi, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <sighs> All right, um, I'm going to step in. Joyce, I know you just joined, but what we're doing is going around the room and we're saying if we're members of the club and what brings us here today, if you want to take yourself off mute and just give us a quick 15 seconds on what your deal is, that would be awesome. There you go, Stefan. You're still on mute though. Ask to unmute. Let me see if I know how to do this. There you no, go. I'm no. on. Sorry. Uh, Stephen Joyce, I'm a reporter for Bloomberg, new member, and just am interested to learn about the real estate market. It's going up, down, moving sideways. That's why I'm here. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to- oh, By the way, I should say this. I'm, I'm not reporting on this. You can say whatever you want. It's off the record. I'm not, this is not <laughs> a business thing. Okay. OTI, everyone. Hold them to it. Uh, okay, so last but not least, before I introduce our speakers, I'm going to jump over to Mr. Stephen Smutney. He is the chairperson, the newly appointed chairperson of the real estate group of Union League. So introduce yourself, Stephen, and then I'm going to get on to our speakers. Thanks, Barney. So as Marnie said, I am the new chairperson of the real estate committee at the Union League Club. I am a principal at Dearborn Architects and a managing partner of Dearborn Sourcing, which does 
custom construction materials. So Marnie was wonderful enough to work with my past uh, chair of the committee, Rob Whalen, to put this together. So Marnie, thank you, thank you. Um, you made it so easy for this first one that I'm attending. It's wonderful. We have more uh, great speakers coming up for the Real Estate Committee in 2021. If you're not on the list, sir, hit me up and we will make sure that you get on it. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Yay. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Stephen. Happy to make everyone's life as easy as possible. <laughs> uh, okay, so now we'll get to the meat of the day, which is, I mean, the meat of it really, the reason the club exists is so that we can have an environment where we can learn and hopefully meet other great like-minded, smart, interesting, cool people. And that's, you know, by default, everyone on this call. So thank you for everyone for being here. And, um, you know, the, the real estate group and the entrepreneur group are just member run. Like, so we're just interested in what we do and we like to share what we do with other people. So kudos to Steven for stepping up to the chair spot. It's not always easy and sometimes it's a lot of work, but hopefully we're adding and helping a lot of members in the process and expanding your own horizons. So I'm gonna jump in and introduce our speakers. I'm gonna start with Miss Emily Smith. Emily, you wanna say hello? I'll give her a little spiel for her, but she's a commercial real estate um, broker who helps small to medium-sized businesses, mostly privately held, kind of renegotiate or negotiate their contracts. So if you haven't renegotiated your contract for your real estate space in a commercial setting, uh, she's gonna kind of give you the lowdown on probably how to do it and why you are never too late, especially during a time when commercial real estate's kind of up and down. Emily, did I miss anything on you? You got it. No, nope, okay. that was better than I could have done. There you go. <laughs> All right, good deal. Next up, we're gonna go with Mr. Mark Volpe. He is our real estate attorney, and he was really the impetus for me wanting to do this call because he spoke in another group that we are both involved in, and he talked about how, how commercial real estate taxes are just going nuts over here, and it just, it blew, it literally blew my mind as to how the city of Chicago is handling COVID and the riots and real estate taxes and just maybe not being so kind to some of our corporate real estate folks. So he's going to talk a lot about that. Mark, did I miss anything? No, nope, that's pretty much it. <laughs> we talked for a long time. I'll tear it down quite a bit. Hey, yeah, uh, yeah, well, it's <laughs> fine, but he's he's got a lot of interesting things to say. And then last but not least is Ryan. He's our residential real estate guy. So he's going to be talking about what's going on out there, where people are moving to, where people aren't moving to, what people are looking for, and you know, kind of give us some background on what's happening in the residential real estate market. Ryan, did I miss anything? No, this is perfect. Okay, perfect. Ryan's gonna kick us off, but before he kicks us off, if you guys do have any questions that come up, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll find them there. Uh, I'd appreciate if everyone can stay on mute. If you don't, I'm just going to put you on mute. So I'm a little bossy bosserson when it comes to this stuff. And, um, but I'd, I'd love to hear your questions as they're throughout. And then of course, we're going to take Q and A at the end. So we have a lot of things to discuss. So with no further ado, oh, I guess I'm Marnie Smiley. I run the entrepreneur group. I also run a full service marketing agency. So I help clients get more clients or more money or more exposure, or everything in between. And okay, enough about me. Moving on to Ryan, 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 Ryan. Are you ready to get our party started? Sure, absolutely. Okay. On to you. All right, fantastic. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Douglas Wells. I'm a real, uh, residential real estate broker. Um, I head up the Stephen and Ryan group for Keller Williams One Chicago. Um, uh, thank you, Marnie, for inviting me. Um, I'm not a member of the club, and I'm actually excited to be here to learn a little bit about commercial because it's a totally different uh, business than mine. Uh, this is my 10th year in the business, um, and my clients have taken me from Hyde Park to the North Shore, Western suburbs. Um, but real estate is, as you all know, is hyper focused on locality. So um, I probably most of my comments are going to be focused upon the North Side neighborhoods of Chicago. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, or we can talk about it at the end about um, those other areas. But um, uh, that's pretty much where the preponderance of my experience has been. 
So uh, to start us off, um, I thought I should probably be clear about what I mean when I use certain terms. So obviously real estate is like any other market where we're dealing with supply and demand. Supply in this case is we're talking about sellers, um, people who are putting their places on the market, demand being um, the number of ready, willing, and able buyers and, and a level of their enthusiasm that defines uh, pricing for our market. Um, as real estate brokers, we're often uh, focused on, we're, we're balancing two perspectives. Out the, in a car analogy, we're looking out the windshield uh, for what's coming in the new market. And we're balancing that with the rear view mirror, which is the appraisal perspective of what's happened in past markets. Uh, trying to understand what we can expect. Um, so let's start there. In 2020, despite um, the pandemic and uh, stay at home orders and all kinds of things, we actually saw a pretty strong year in real estate. Uh, we were considered to be an essential business, so we were protected. Uh, I was very busy. Um, we saw about a 3.5% growth in detached single family home volume. So 3.5% growth in the number of transactions taking place as well as an 11.3% increase in prices. So we saw both volume and pricing go up on that. On attached single family homes, which would be like condos and townhomes, or you're not buying the land, you're just buying the, um, the residential unit. Um, we saw a slight contraction in the number of uh, transactions by about three, three and a half percent, but we still saw 5.6% 5 5 increase in median sales price. So despite fewer transactions, we're still seeing sales prices go up. What does this mean? It means we have substantial demand in the marketplace. Um, the Case-Shiller report, which indexes uh, home values across different cities in the country to compare us, so, um, put us at about a 5% increase in their index home price for Chicago. Now, what's important about that is unfortunately what I'm not mentioning with that, which is that we were like 18th out of 20 uh, for uh, the major metropolitan areas that Case-Shiller tracks. And we've been this way, we've been in the lower quartile on this, lowest quartile on this since I got into the business. And like I said, that's been about 10 years. Um, why is that? Um, well, we saw about a 30% contraction in home values after the 2008 crash. And we've been steadily growing our value back since 2012, which was kind of the bottom of the market. Um, the financial health of the state and the city does play into this. I see, I hear from clients a lot uh, especially clients moving to Chicago, um, concern about, about whether their property taxes are going to go up because that's most, most homeowners assume that they're going to get hit with this at some point when they're trying to fill budget holes. Um, so that has, I think, in some ways put a negative pressure on that growth and recovery. When we look at 2020 versus 2019, um, what we see is some market leaders in Edgewater, Lakeview, and West Town. Um, Lakeview was the attached single family uh, leader. So in a sense, condos and townhomes transacted um, about 7.4% growth in total uh, transaction count. But what was staggering was that of those transactions, we saw about an 18.6% increase in median sales price. I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat that. There was an 18.6% increase in median sales price on attached single family homes in Lakeview. That's extraordinary, especially during a year when we were all sheltering in place and sometimes. West Town showed the highest growth in terms of the detached single family. Again, this is where you're buying the land. This is like a, a traditional home, a, a house, I should say. Um, in that case, we saw a contraction in the total volume by four and a half percent, but we also saw a growth of 5.6 percent in pricing. Um, more significantly, we saw about a 20 percent reduction in market times. So prices are going up, market times are really low there. Whereas like in Lakeview, for example, even though they saw about the same amount of increase, we saw about a 9% increase in market time. So it took longer for sellers in Lakeview to find their value, even though it was higher than it was the year before. Um, people always ask me, and so I always throw this in here as kind of like an anecdotal uh, piece of information, um, but uh, home sales were about 96% of original list price. So sales price compared to original list price, you got about 96%. So unless you're really not pricing your property well, you can expect very close to list when you go to negotiations. Uh, absorption, let's talk about this because this, this is a big metric we use when we try to understand the interplay between supply and demand. Um, generally, we, we measure the amount of inventory based upon what we know about demand by how many months supply we think we have. Um, in December, CAR, the uh, Chicago Association of Realtors, um, reported the lowest uh, number we have on record, which was 1.9 month supply. 
Um, this speaks to our overall all trend in real estate, which is that we do not have enough inventory to satisfy the demand. Um, now, bigger question, what is gonna happen in 2021? Uh, well, the Chicago Association of Real Realtors convened its 2021 Market Outlook Forum earlier this month. And some of the key takeaways that I've been focused on are the following, um, specifically with respect to rental markets. Uh, the performance of a rental market is gonna depend heavily upon how we handle this pandemic and the vaccine rollout. Um, Moody's um, reported a substantial decrease in the consumer um, confidence index in real estate that can be re reversed if we can get the vaccine out to um, the widest population as quickly as possible. I think people will, will feel much more confident about real estate in that, in that um, uh, instance. Um, I'm consistently, anecdotally, I'm seeing one to two months uh, free rent um, uh, advertised uh, for rental market, uh, either re-signing your lease or new leases. Um, the the uh, incentive is usually higher for new leases. Uh, rental price growth was the slowest it's been in nine years last year. It only raised 1.4%. Um, and that's because the, <laughs> the rental price for properties in Chicago is high. Uh, the average for a one bedroom is about 1,700. And for a two bedroom, it's about 2,000. That's expensive. I mean, that's the equivalent of owning a three to $400,000 property in terms of a mortgage. Um, uh, also, interestingly, the data from the National Association of Realtors suggested that we have this narrative that people are like fleeing the city. It's not exactly true. The data suggests that people are moving from downtown, but what they're not doing is they're not going out to the suburbs necessarily. Um, what we see is they're converting from a renter to a buyer, which explains a lot why my volume was up so high last year. So people are absolutely moving out of downtown and we can talk about the, the negative impact on the Gold Coast, the River North and Streeterville markets. Um, but essentially a lot of them are converting to buyers because they're tired of paying such high prices um, for rental quality um, uh, apartments. Um, the largest share of home buyers continues to be 25 to 34 years old. Uh, so the millennial group, um, and they account for 23% of all buyers. So almost a quarter of buyers are millennials. And this is going to drive a lot of the real estate trends going forward. Um, this group is much more sensitive to affordability. Um, so we're going to look for an uptick in lower to middle income or middle priced home sales, not the luxury market necessarily to explode, but that middle to, um, to low uh, price point. So the first time home buyer. Hey, Ryan. Uh, this group Yes. What, hold on. What's considered that luxury price point break versus like a middle in Chicago? That's a good question. So when I say low to middle, I'm thinking like probably 300 to 500 is the meat of that market. Um, above 500 to let's say 750 is kind of a transitional point. And then above 750 is really more of the luxury uh, the market. Um, this group uh, has been hit by a perfect storm of financial factors. They've seen two major financial crises in their lifetime, um, and they are crippled by student debt. They have the most student debt of anybody we've seen in this country thus far. And now we have COVID-19. So you've got folks coming out of college and, and all of their training programs, getting their first home or their first jobs, their first couple jobs. They're hit with multiple factors. So um, I would expect to see from this group, as I do when I work with them, um, they're much more interested in affordability and quality. Uh, they want flexible floor plans. They want to be able to work from home, uh, as most of them have now experienced that so that's the case. So the open floor plan, which was so much the, the thing in vogue in the early 2000s, is, is some people actually want more segmentation so that they can work from home. Over, I need an office space. I, I might need, I, me and my partner might need an office space. Um, the outdoor spaces. So we're going to be home a lot more. Um, as we get accustomed to this new reality. I hear all the time from clients like, well, there's COVID, but we assume that this is probably gonna happen again in the future. Um, so outdoor space becomes more important now because we, if we're living at home all the time, wh where are we gonna entertain ourselves and the few people that we're allowed to bring in? Um, and then condition, nobody wants to take on a project. So I'm telling all of my sellers like, get ready. We have to paint your place. You have substantial equity, your prices are higher, but the buyers are no longer tolerating just anything you put out there. It needs to look good. Um, this group is also less likely to overextend themselves. So financial sensitivity within this group is, is big. Um, they've seen 
financial crises and they know that they can happen. So they wanna be very much within their budget when they're purchasing for the most part. This also adversely affects the 8008 MLS group which is um, River North, Gold Coast, um, and Streeterville, along with the Loop. Because down there, you've got high rises. And high rises represent high population density. Um, and you're looking at uh, elevators where you're in close quarters with your neighbors and or restricted access to get out. Um, and then high HOAs. So this kind of combines to be more challenging in terms of marketing. Um, the millennial group is substantially less interested in a high rise situation. Therefore, we're seeing vast upticks in inventory for Gold Coast, River North, Streeterville. These are the areas where, and I talked to all my broker colleagues, I've got a listing down there right now. It's like, okay, we just need to prepare our sellers to be patient because this market is going to be tough for that area. Um, lastly, more minute, Ryan. Sorry? One more minute, one more minute. Perfect. I've got one more chunk left. <laughs> um, however, all that being said, historically low interest rates in a recovering economy are what, are what gonna drive this, um, this new market. So uh, the chief economist for realtor.com is estimating uh, mortgage rates to be between 3.2 and 3.4% for 2021. I mean, I've, I've had car loans higher than that. So um, buyers will be incentivized to get into the marketplace because it's very cheap to borrow money right now. Um, nationally, we're looking at a, a median sales price increase of about 5.7%. And sales growth, the total volume of transactions up probably about 7%. So for all intents and purposes, I'm very bullish on Chicago's uh, residential market. And um, I think it's going to be a very busy and very competitive spring. Whoop, whoop. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions for Ryan, uh, you know, I'll take one now. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, hold your peace until the end. Anyone? Anyone? All right, Ryan, thank you so much for giving us that breakdown. It's a lot to cover. It's a lot to take on trying to talk about Chicago real estate. Yet, I still try to maybe do it in 10 minutes or less. So thanks for taking the challenge on. Um, and we'll My be pleasure. taking questions at the end. So we'll have about 10 minutes worth of time for questions. So if something comes up in between Ryan sips of whiskey, then please let us know. And you know we're happy to help you. But now we're gonna move on to Mark's portion of the presentation. Mark's gonna be highlighting kind of how, how corporate real estate's been affected, especially on the tax side. So I know Mark, you have some uh, screen shares to do. So are you ready to set yourself up for screen share? And then- Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be able to figure it out. Okay. Yeah. It's all yours, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, before I share my screen, yeah, I just, just had some uh, things to say. I'm not so bullish on the commercial market um, going forward. And that's partially because of COVID, but also because of what's been going on with real estate taxes. Uh, COVID, through, throughout 29, uh, 2020, I should say, COVID has had a chilling effect on the re commercial real estate market with volume down. Emily will talk probably more and more educated than I will about this. But prior to uh, 2020, 2019 was also a very, very uh, down year for commercial real estate volume. Um, from 2018 to 2019, transaction volume decreased by 59%, or, I'm sorry, 49%, which is almost about halfway. And a, a big portion of that was caused by the way that property taxes are being, uh, uh, property assessments are being calculated. Uh, in 2018, December of 2018, a new assessor of Cook County was elected, and 2019 was his, real, his first chance to reassess uh, a portion of Cook County. And for those who don't know, Cook County, for tax purposes, is divided into thirds. And uh, last year, 20, in 20, sorry, in 2019, last year from my perspective, two years ago from where we're at now in real life, uh, 2019 was the reassessment of the north suburbs, north and northwest suburbs of Chicago. The assessor uh, had a new formula, um, basically had a new way of valuing commercial properties, and it resulted in some significant increases. Um, those significant increases created uncertainty and apprehension among buyers and among property owners. Uh, they gave way to rising commercial values for tax purposes, but not in the real marketplace. And uh, the effect had was basically to shift commercial, uh, to shift property taxes away from residentials and over to the commercial base. Uh, 
And I have uh, just share my screen screen quickly here. Uh, so this new assessor is kind of wreaking some havoc, and I think Mark's going to cover that a little bit more. Big time. Uh, and so, yeah, what, what the assessor is doing is basically taking uh, the commercial property base and uh, cranking up the taxes on it, essentially. So what we saw, I, I took a sampling, which is Maine Township. Uh, properties are divided into townships, 38 townships within Cook County, Maine Township being one of them. And in 2018, prior to it being reassessed, you see here, there was a breakdown of about 71.9% 71, 71 on the residential portion and 28.1% on the commercial portion. Uh, when the assessor reassessed Main Township, he shifted it over and he increased commercial property values by an average in the north suburbs of around 75%. Um, as you can see here, when he made the initial revaluation, residential properties did not go up by anywhere near that same metric. So there's uh, a clear shift from residential properties to commercial properties, which would have the effect of increasing taxes on commercial and away from residential, aka voters. Uh, that was the first step. Unfortunately, uh, the assessment is only the first step in the assessment and property tax process. There's a Cook County Board of Review, and their sole responsibility is to adjudicate property taxes. And what they found was that the assessor's uh, methodology that he was using to value properties was a little flawed. So when they went through the appeal process, uh, most of the commercial property owners who were hit with three, four, even some, in some cases five times their previous values, which would have uh, necessarily increased their taxes by three, four, almost five times what they were previously. They filed appeals and the Board of Review more or less restored the balance to what it was. A uh, bit of a shift onto the commercial sector, but um, by and large, uh, property values were back to where they kind of were. Um, that, at this point, that's ancient history because COVID came along and changed everything. And what the assessors started doing for 2020 was looking at these values that he set um, or that the board of review set back in 2019. And he started making changes. Now I mentioned in Cook County, a third of the county is reassessed every year, but this year the assessor undertook the position of trying to reassess the entire county uh, to account for the effect of COVID. However, all things are not equal and the assessor um, reduced values on residential properties just as a whole, but he did not do the same thing with commercial properties. So the assessor granted what he was calling COVID relief, where following the appeal process this year at his level, he reduced residential properties between 7 and 15%, depending on uh, his estimation of how much the property had reduced. Now, as Ryan just explained, residential properties were not seeing these drops in value of 7 to 15%, rather as you said, 18% increases in Lakeview Township, 5% price increases, all the volume down in West Township. And in the suburbs, north, especially the north and northwest suburbs, uh, they saw the same trends with prices increasing. Still, the assessor decided he was going to reduce uh, commercial or residential assessments between 7 and 15%. So what this did, and you can see all the way on the right-hand column, um, in Main Township, for example, assuming a 10% decrease in the residential uh, assessment base is what I've calculated here, that's going to further and once again shift property taxes back onto the commercial portion. Um, that's not going to be, uh, that there's not going to be much that a lot of commercial property owners are going to be able to do to fight it because he hasn't changed the values that were set last year by the Board of Review. However, the Board of Review this year has taken on uh, and we're, we're expecting them to do the same next year. They've taken an approach to granting equitable relief, granting property tax relief to commercial properties in cases where they, COVID has affected them. The real effect of closing down restaurants and closing, basically making hotels all but obsolete at this point, um, challenges people not wanting to move into nursing homes, movie theaters, complete you know, downturn in the movie business being released in theaters, all these different sectors of commercial properties the Board of Review has taken an, uh, an approach of saying, well, we'll consider all of these factors when we set the assessments this year. So we expect that when the 2020 session is closed, balance may be restored again. However, it, it, it also may not be. Now, certainly warehouses, grocery stores, gas stations, things of that nature, they're not going to have the same uh, 
they, they're not facing the same challenges as movie theaters, hotels, and restaurants. And so they may not, uh, there may not be much relief that they can get. So when everything is said and done, uh, there likely will be a, a shift back on the commercial properties on a whole. Now, what we expect to see for 2021 is what uh, we, we anticipate is the assessor has been waiting for a couple of years now to get his hands on the city of Chicago. 2021, this year, will be the reassessment of the city of Chicago. And uh, his campaign, his uh, basically everything that he ran on, uh, it promised to raise property assessments on commercial properties within the city because he, his campaign was based on uh, an allegation that Commercial property values in the city are set far below true market value. So we're anticipating huge increases again when it comes time to reassess the city, namely the areas in the Loop and West Loop, River North, um, Townships in North Chicago, West Chicago, South Chicago, where all the larger commercial buildings are. Uh, we anticipate that what the assessor will do will be to raise values uh, significantly on the first pass and then uh, to continue to gum up the works, for lack of a better term, on, on the appeal process. The assessor has um, made it much more difficult to file an appeal, file a successful appeal, especially at his office, uh, by requiring additional pages of and pages and pages that we need to fill out in order to file an appeal, eliminating a process called re-review, where you can ask the assessor to take a second look at it in the event he misses something. Um, and just taking more of a much, much more conservative uh, approach to valuing property. Um, so we anticipate going forward that the assessors will continue to uh, increase values in the city. We've seen it in the South, although to a lesser degree. 2020, I guess I should mention, is the year that the South and Western suburbs are being reassessed. And uh, initially we saw values very similar to the values that he was proposing for the North and Northwest suburbs. Um, However, he backed off that a little bit once COVID, the effects of COVID started uh, showing their face. And the values, value increases were not nearly as egregious as they were in the North. So we expect that the city will be hit very hard uh, and it will be more essential than ever to file appeals. So that would be uh, to combat that if you are a property owner in the city of Chicago, which I know a number of people on here are, uh, especially a commercial property owner. One, make sure you're appealing. And two, if you're a commercial property investor and you're looking uh, to possibly start investing in Chicago, consider incentive opportunities that may be available. Uh, when a property has been sitting vacant or when there's a financial need, it's possible to qualify for a property tax incentive, which drastically reduces your property tax burden for a period of 10 to 12 years. Uh, Basically, if, if your property meets the qualifications, you're entitled to what would be about a 60% diminution in value, which translates to a 60% reduction in property taxes. So certainly explore options for incentives. And again, above all, uh, make, sure you, uh, make, make sure you're appealing your property taxes. Marty, that's pretty much the much condensed down version of what I explained Wait, to you. Wait, Marty delivered. Um, so in case you didn't hear it, if you are in the city of Chicago, expect your property taxes to go up, like, I mean, an annoying an amount and try to appeal, although the appeal process is really mucky and gross. And, you know, I guess be careful of who we think about coming in for the assessor. I'll ask this question later, but, you know, obviously this may be good for residential people. Yes, no. Uh, the short answer is yes, it will have a positive effect for residences, although uh, I mentioned he's reducing assessments between 7 and 15 percent, the net effect will, much, will be much lower than that, probably in the 1 or 2 percent range. Taxes should go down, whereas opposed to in the past, they always go up. Uh, taxes on residences in the north and northwest suburbs in the city of Chicago should go down a little bit, but the effect won't be as drastic as he's claimed. Okay. Okay, well, we feel free to ask him more questions, ask Mark more questions about you know, what to expect from a corporate tax standpoint and what to do about it if you get hit with some crazy taxes. He'll be able to help you there. Mark, if you don't mind, can you share your um, profile in the chat or your LinkedIn on how people can get in touch with you if they have any questions? Ryan, I already shared mm -hmm. yours, but if there's another place better than your website, feel free to go for it. And now we're on to uh, Emily. Emily's going to be talking about, so let's say you end up in 
Elise in Chicago right now, and you are wondering if you need to renegotiate it, change it, get out of it, you know, what to do from here. And she's going to walk you through what that state looks like and what to do next. Your turn, Emily. And right now you're still on mute. Yep, got it. Got there it. we go. Okay. Thanks, Marnie. I appreciate it. Go for it, girlfriend. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here. I just put together one slide for everyone to keep it very, I'm gonna kind of from a very high level of kind of what's going on. Cause I know my biggest pet peeve right now is there's so much noise, right? Especially with like real estate, it's a different headline, like different day, right? So I'm just trying to be very transparent. And like Marnie said, we wanna really have a conversation. So if you have questions, um, just put them in the chat and Marnie can poke in and, and let me know. But a lot of what Mark has said is true and it's uh, terrifying, right? And so we've been preparing for this, you know, for the last 18 months and underwriting deals and stuff and positioning our clients and trying to provide as much shepherding as possible. Um, so that is the doom, right? Is this is hanging, especially downtown. So I represent privately held companies, as Marnie says, with all of their real estate needs. So we do office and industrial, we do acquisition disposition, but I'm focusing on simply office today and mainly like downtown office because I thought that would be most relevant to this group. So kind of where are we at today, right? So as I mentioned, there's a ton of noise. Um, you'll read a different headline every day, office is dead, this and that. It's simply not true. It's 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 a very con it's confusing to entrepreneurs and to business owners um, because you can read a totally different article every different day. But for us, the position we're taking because we represent, as Marnie said, small to mid-sized businesses, privately held companies. Um, for us, we still really feel that we're 12 to 18 months out from the bottom of the market. So I started in my career in 2008 at the first recession, and it took three years really to see the bottom of the market. So um, we've been kind of screaming that from the mountaintops because it's not like the financial markets where, you know, I, I hear from clients all the time, well, the market's changed. Everybody's getting out of their leases. It should be the opportune time to do something. And we feel that opportunity is out there. That's what's exciting for us. And we're telling our clients, but what we're really trying to do is position our clients to take advantage. So a lot of leases that we had coming up last year, we punted for a year. Um, so instead of doing a typical five, seven, 10 year deal, we punted for 12 months so we can try and position them. So if you are in a position that you have a lease coming up in the next 12 to 24 months, you're going to be able to take advantage of that. One of the biggest things that is out there right now is sublease spaces that are flooding the market. That is, um, you know, I don't know if anybody caught the article on cranes. I think it was last week, but right now there's 5.3 million square feet of sublease space flooding the market. And for landlords, um, that's a huge pain point. So for me, um, uh, that makes me excited um, because for us, since we represent companies and tenants, that is a significant opportunity for anyone out there that's in a position to make a real estate decision. But for landlords, um, it's a huge pain point because at some points they're gonna have to start competing uh, for those spaces. So they're competing with sublease spaces right now. There's essentially zero demand. Um, there's no market essentially right now. We're starting to see that come back very slowly. Um, but I, I don't think our industry has ever experienced anything it has in the last like nine to 12 months where it just comes to a screeching halt. And so landlords are incredibly nervous. Um, and, and to top it off, there's also new product that's coming online. So there's four large new towers that are flooding the market um, in the West Loop and then in Fulton Market as well. So they're competing with those new, uh, those new buildings. So essentially we run off of in 2019, um, there was, I think it was the lowest vacancy that we have seen in this market in 25 years. So you had in 2019, it's like a tale of two different, two different years, right? So 2019, you had a lot of large corporations that were coming in from the coast. So the Googles, the Facebooks of the world, they were setting up secondary offices here because it was a, 
it, it was a significant savings compared to the coast, right? So they flooded the market. They essentially were making it very difficult for entrepreneurs to find space, much, le much less negotiate space. And that has completely changed this year. So that's where we're saying, you know, 2021 and 22 is going to be a huge opportunity for anybody, um, any leader out there that can, uh, that is in a position to make real estate decisions. So then that becomes the big question of what does the office of the future look like? And honestly, I am super transparent on this, that we still don't know. Nobody out there, I mean, people have thoughts and ideas and everything, but, but the reality is no one can tell you for a fact what that's going to look like. What we're seeing and what we're hearing a lot of is, um, and we, we're excited about this because we were challenging our clients to rethink about how they're using their office space pre-COVID. So the fact that this is, you know, this is a big trend right now, we're excited about it because we like the hybrid work model where people rethink about how they're using their office. It's going to become more um, more meeting space, more collaboration space, instead of necessarily having a desk for every person that's there. And that is what everybody's trying to figure out right now. In 2019, you know, in you know, the last five years, people were getting very, very dense where it got as, as little as like 75 square feet per employee. Um, that has essentially gone away now due to COVID. Um, people are spreading out, uh, you know, giving, you know, it's going back to more, you know, there's some architects on here, so they could probably give you better uh, quotes than I could, but, you know, it's getting much less dense. So that's what people are looking for. And the open, you know, it's very similar to the residential market that Ryan was talking about. Wide open space plans with everybody in a bullpen have kind of gone away. Um, so what a lot of our clients are seeing, because we represent, like I said, privately held companies, we're talking to CEOs, CFO, CEOs, yeah. you know, hundreds of them on a monthly basis. The majority of them have said, everybody's coming back to work. That is what we're hearing. It's very different from maybe the, you know, large corporations of the world, but for us, that is what we're hearing. Um, they are having a very difficult time, um, onboarding new talent and recruiting people. They just don't feel bought into the culture. Um, and then now that the vaccine, you know, has kind of is rolling out, it gives them a time frame to plan from, right? So the majority of them are talking about going back in June if they're not already back yet. Um, but they are excited about the opportunity to find, um, to make it more efficient, the office space and really rethink it. Um, but every company is different. So again, you know, this is not like a, a blanket strategy for everyone, but that is what we're hearing from our clients. So let's talk about like the opportunity, what Marnie was saying is where is the opportunity here if you are a business owner and you have a lease or in a position to renegotiate your space. We really see a tremendous amount of sublease um, space as an opportunity. I can give you a quick, um, a quick example of that. So. I just recently closed a deal for Condé to Global. Um, they were a growing company, regardless of the pandemic, they were still growing. And, you know, they were evaluating direct space versus sublease space. We found this amazing space. Um, it happened to be in Oak Brook for about 12,000 square feet. And it, um, we were able to lock them in for seven years at 50% below market um, on a true gross lease. So it came with furniture, um, it was a brand new built out. And so essentially that saved them $2 million over the next seven years. And I, you know, we're seeing that time and time again. I mean, the savings are dramatic on these spaces. Another thing that's kind of changed that a lot of the architects on the call are, you know, they would understand that, that spec spaces are, are a big piece of the business right now. So landlords are freaking out. And so what they're doing is throwing as much money as possible, as possible into these spaces because everybody has been holding off on decisions, getting spaces ready to try and attract, attract tenants and employees back to the space as soon as they're able. So that is a big trend right now. And before, previously, 2019, if you were a tenant looking at a spec space, they would demand a seven to 10 year deal. And they landlords have completely backed off term at this point in time. So a lot of the spec spaces we're looking at, landlords are willing to do one, two, and three-year deals just to get people back and in the space. So there's some huge opportunity there. Most of them are, 
you know, brand new spaces, ready to go furniture in place. Um, a big thing is that we're working on right now is early lease restructures. We still feel that we're a little too early for this. So if you can hold tight, please do so. Um, but you can start working on these as, you know, in the next, I think six months would be a really good time frame. as soon as those landlords start to really feel um, the pain. Uh, I mean, and, and I mean that as of November, the REITs reported that 96% of tenants that were occupying space were still paying their rent. So they haven't felt that pain of tenants necessarily leaving the building, the market and off the rent rolls yet. So that takes time for those workouts to occur. So once that happens, um, those early lease restructures, even as far as four years out, if you're sitting in a lease and you have four years <coughs> remaining or a termination option, you can leverage those things to get, um, significantly better terms. Um, low risk right now, a lot of landlords are backing off securitization. So security deposits, you know, um, deal costs, if you will. So they're backing off some of that just to attract them, which is great. Um, and so essentially all in all, it's just gonna be a lower cost of occupancy um, is going to be what we're seeing over the next, uh, we're calling it 36 months. So if you're in a position to do those, then it's a great time to just have that conversation. That's really it, that's all I got. Hey, um, well, I mean, I think what you have to share is pretty significant on if you, especially if you have property in the downtown area or if you have never had property and, or I guess if you're trying to get office space, not property. Uh, Emily can really kind of walk you through the process and whether you're 12 months out, 18 months out, 36 months out, I mean, in a normal environment, people are looking for your leasing space at least 24 hour or 24 months out, right, Emily? Yeah, typically that would be 24 months out, but right now, I mean, we're just really having conversations with people because it has been incredibly confusing on how and when to safely bring employees back, right? And, you know, what is space needs moving forward? It, this, they could really use this as an opportunity to get efficient. And we've done several of those transactions over the last month where we are downsizing people, right? A lot of the big subleases that you've seen coming online are tech firms that took way too much space or, you know, corporations that have had significant layoffs, right? I've seen very few people that have gone virtual or fully remote. Got it. All right. Well, we only have a few more minutes. I'm probably going to take us just a little bit past seven. Um, but for anyone who has questions for Mark about, you know, how not to get screwed in your corporate tax for Emily on how not to get screwed in your, you know, leasing and for Ryan on how to get the best deal or placement for a home, um, they are all yours. So does anyone here have any questions, comments, things you'd like to ask, uh, you know, John, what do we got here? This is all you go for it, buddy. For, for Mark, um, this tax situation. Oh, it's terrible. People keep moving. They're just going to raise everybody else's taxes. We're going to be in a downward spiral. Do you see any end to this? Or do you see anything that could happen that could change this? You're currently on mute, Mark. I'm going to take you off. Go. Okay, now you're uh, That is, uh, could be a long answer. Uh, basically, what we saw happen in some of the south suburbs where uh, people stop paying their real estate taxes because the taxes got so bad. Places like Harvey, uh, Fort Heights, where the tax rate is effectively 100% of their assessed value, people just stop paying because the penalty for not paying your property taxes is that your taxes are sold at the tax sale and eventually somebody can go to deed and own the property. Uh, with a, for example, I have a client who bought a property for $500,000. Two years later, his tax bill was $280,000 a year. Nobody wants to own that property. There's no incentive for him to pay. There's no uh, you know, real risk of him not paying. And if things get bad, that could be where the northern suburbs are headed. However, right now, it's still more than worth it to pay your property tax and to hold on to your property in the vast majority of the county. Um, to the extent that people will move out, people won't pay right now. Uh, the treasurer just put out an article yesterday or the day before saying that we're looking at a 10% delinquency in property taxes uh, for commercial properties not being able to afford to pay um, because of COVID and because their values are so much higher. 
Um, it, it is, yeah, it will be, will result in a shift on the, the remaining people who are paying the taxes. Um, there is a possibility, and I don't want to get political at all, uh, but there is a possibility for something to be done down in Springfield um, you know, in the coming few months, weeks, years, however long it may take. But um, it probably will take some sort of legislation to um, stem property taxes. Yeah, I mean, we just see so many people moving to the collar counties and or abandoning their building. I had one client abandon their building and they moved to Will County and built a building, you know, and they, yeah, you see that happening. And I'm just like, what's going to happen with all these buildings and all these people if they start leaving? And if the taxes are half of what they are in Indiana or Will County, South suburbs are going to lose all their industry. That's true. And that, and that is exactly where the uh, incentive comes in because once a building is abandoned, uh, a new buyer or a new occupant can qualify the building for an incentive and get the property taxes reduced 60% um, for a period of 10 years. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah, in, in the short term, it might look real bad, but pretty soon uh, those buildings will start qualifying for incentives and somebody will reoccupy them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you, John sure. and Mark. Anyone else have some more questions for our three brilliant people here? I'll ask another one. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Nerd out. Uh, for the first gentleman, I forgot his name. Ryan. Um, Ryan. Um, what do you think the property values in the near north, the uh, Streeterville area is going to re get reduced to? I mean, you, would you see a 10% drop or a... So I'm... I'm more optimistic than that. I think what will happen is it's going to take a lot longer for them to get their value. Um, do I see people taking major haircuts on this? No, I see people holding onto their properties longer um, and waiting for that demand to show up. Um, I've prepared all of my sellers that are down there. Like, listen, I can get you your value, but you're going to have to wait. And it could be until like we have um, mass acceptance of the vaccine where people feel more comfortable moving into a high rise situation or when people return to the office and the draw of the River North and Streeterville area is that you're close to work and you can walk there when that actually becomes again an incentive. I see that being something more like late summer, early fall, potentially next, next year's markets. So we might see people come on, we might see people pull their property off the market. You're gonna see some people take a haircut because they wanna to shift to something else. But for the most part, I don't think they're compelled to do that unless there's a personal compelling reason. I, I think that market will return. There's no question. It's just a question of how long it's gonna take. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that comment, Andy. Andy says, I've started to see wealthy buyers buying units in the same building as long as there's no rental restriction, which is an issue they're also dealing with. And, you know, to be fair, I think in some of those rental, in some of those big buildings that's, you know, put in there for a reason. Um, we can take maybe one more question. I know we're at seven and I have one announcement to make. So if there's, is there anything else in anyone else's mind here? Yeah, nothing, 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 nothing going once, going twice. Okay, sold back to Marty. So um, thank you everyone for coming, for sharing. I've shared our three speakers information in the chat. So if you wanna get in touch with them directly about some other questions or further comments, I'm sure they would be happy to entertain anything that's on your mind or feel free to contact me um, through the entrepreneur group or Marnie at bumperlanes.com. I'll put it in the chat too. And I'm happy to make any introductions, whether it was someone who was speaking here or just someone who you felt like floating little head sounded interesting to you and you just want a connection. That's what the union league's about is connecting great people with other great people. Uh, my final announcements are to do with the, with the entrepreneur group. So to give me an idea of some of our speakers coming up next month's speaker is going to be, he just got promoted, but he runs the base up in, um, Wilmette or just North of there. I'm forgetting the name of the town. But he is head of all the recruits up there, and he basically got deployed to the base when COVID hit. And he's going to be talking about what it was like to kind of deal with 40,000 recruits from all over the country coming to one place during COVID and how to just how it was leadership under pressure and what that looked like for him and for the base and for just the military in general. That's our next speaker. 
on February 21st. And then our next set of speakers will be you guys. So I, um, we are doing our first TED talk or TED-like talk. The topics are gratitude and happiness. So if you'd like to submit a talk on 10 minutes on what gratitude or happiness or the way I've been putting it has been lack of happiness, you know, COVID hit people and this uh, quarantine time hit people in all kinds of different ways. And, you know, maybe you weren't happy. Maybe it was a really terrible, depressing, awful time. Maybe you couldn't go to your parents' funerals. Maybe you couldn't see the people that you wanted to see. Um, or maybe you really realized what, you know, kind of is a little more about your core that you weren't able to do during all the craziness outside of quarantine. So we are um, taking applications for talks and I'm kind of on the more the merrier. I'd really love to hear from people. It doesn't have to just be at the club. You don't have to just be a member of the club because I just want some really good speakers in here. So if you know anyone who's a member or not, who you think would find interesting to talk about happiness or you know, how gaining 10 pounds does make you happy, then you know, we're, we're all in, I'm all in. Uh, you can go to the uh, group's Facebook page or we also have a listserv as well, or just spread it, spread the info. We've got a few good applications that I'm really excited about. And I just, I want our members to have a voice even if we don't have a voice necessarily in present all the time. And I'm hoping that by the March time, we may, may not be able to have a room full of attendees, but I think we'll at least be able to have our speakers be at the club and speaking from the club and then broadcasting it out like, like a normal TED talk. So it'll be, you know, right up the alley. So questions, comments on that, feel free to, you know, give me an email. My info is over here. Otherwise, uh, I think we're gonna close it out. Thank you to everyone who came and thank you so much to Emily, Ryan, and Mark for sharing your great knowledge. And once again, if you guys want to hear more about their great knowledge, feel free to contact them directly or me and we'll happily connect you. Thank That's you it. everyone. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> See you guys. Thank you.